This episode is brought to you by Ursa Minor Outfitters. Folks, I'm absolutely in love with my Loon mug. It's handmade. It's an absolute piece of art. Whether it's at the office or at the house, people keep asking to check it out. If you're not a Loon fan, they also have other beautiful mugs for wildlife fans of moose, bears, and eagles. They specialize in products highlighting the outdoors and local pride through quality design by local artists. They've even started expanding into items beyond mugs, like apparel, dog accessories, and soon candles and more. They also try to partner and highlight other small businesses, and in some cases, forgo profits in lieu of charitable giving to help their community, such as the dog rescue. So check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for our four-legged hiking partners, they also have a portable silicone dog bowl and also a sweet over-the-collar dog bandana. Go check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and don't forget to enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. latest episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm your host Ivan and I'm excited to share this new season of the podcast with you. With both fall and winter arriving in the Pacific Northwest, it's time to store the mobile recording studio. This season we'll be switching things up and interviewing some of my favorite hikers that I follow on Instagram virtually. We're following a similar format to season one where the first part of the episode focuses on the guest and their hiking adventures and we're still going to end each episode with a speed round of this or that questions all related to hiking. Today's episode is the second part of our chat with Allie. You can follow her on Instagram at Allie Rambles. In this episode, we chat with Allie about traveling across the country in an RV, which state has the best sunsets, and a surprising moose encounter in Colorado. Without further ado, let's jump into the second part of the episode with Allie. Allie, you've also ventured outside of the Southwest in the Mini Winnie, um, reaching Florida, the Dakotas. You even got a chance to visit Yellowstone. How many states have you been able to travel in the country so far? In my Mini Winnie, I've only gone to 16. I thought maybe it was more, but, uh, you know, this, the Western states are rather large. So is Texas, you know, so it took me a while to get through Texas. Yeah, it's huge. I just kept joking because I just left Texas and I I would meet people and I'd say, oh, thank God for the cheaper gas. And then I think about it, I go, but I have to drive three times further to get anywhere. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's just kind of a joke in my head while I was there. Um, but 16 states, I thought maybe it was more, but apparently I like traveling through the bigger states. So, <laughs> <laughs> Could you share a little bit about your experience in the Dakotas? Because there's a couple pictures and videos where, you know, the Dakotas, you think of just like prairie lands. I think people think of the Dakotas. At least I stayed at this one place. I forgot the name of it, but it is public lands that you can camp on. And it was outside of this massive, it was part of a massive grasslands forest. It's still considered, I believe, national forest. Same designation. They have like national desert. Is that how they do it? National forest, national prairies. or so. it's, it's designated land that's set aside for public use. So it was it was that. And I didn't realize how beautiful the prairie grasslands are. They were just so serene. It helps when you don't have hay fever as well. Don't have hay fever because it won't be serene for you. You'll just have you have a swollen sinuses and <laughs> luckily I don't have that anymore but I was really really surprised I think I, I thought of them the same way people think of Arizona They're like oh it's just this ugly desert it's hot you know and when you think of the Dakotas you think oh the weather's going to be unpredictable and the grass who wants to see grass oh no it's beautiful especially at sunset and if there's just a breeze it just kind of flows through the grass yeah it almost kind of looks like waves. It, it was just in waves. And then there was this massive storm one night, scared the bejesus out of me, but I can't go anywhere. I just have to sit there and hope my RV doesn't flip over, you know, and hope the wind isn't too bad. Obviously, I'm still safe. But the next morning, there was this beautiful double rainbow. 
I think a lot of things too is in North Dakota, South Dakota, there isn't a lot to do except maybe slow down and enjoy the the great weather that it's giving you at that time. Because I've heard that it can be really, really bad weather up there. So it was a few days of just, I can slow down a little bit here and not feel like I have to go anywhere or see anything. I can just hang out with me and the grasshoppers. There was a ton of grasshoppers. <laughs> yeah, you definitely captured it beautifully. So we, we did a deep dive into your Instagram. And one thing that you do really well is capturing some amazing sunrises and sunsets on your travels. Um, now I'm going to put you on the spot. In your experience traveling across the country, which state has the best sunrises? And then which state has the best sunsets? <laughs> You have to know what I'm going to say here. <laughs> I have an idea, yep. <laughs> I'm, I am very, very biased, but I'm also not being biased because I've done my research as well. But I honestly do believe Arizona for both. I, I can't say sunrise, but I know sunset for sure. Hands down has the best sunset from my personal experience. They, you can sit out in the middle of nowhere on a high desert plain and the clouds turn pink and purple and orange and red and all these blue colors all, all 360 degrees around you if there's clouds. And it's just you're in awe for a good 10, 15 minutes. And it's it, you, you feel really small, too, because it's just massive. And I did research. I did actually literally look up when I first moved to Arizona. I said, why are the Arizona sunsets so beautiful? And it's because of all the dust particles in the air from the desert. Um, they refract the light differently than other parts of the country. Texas had some beautiful sunsets as well. And I do believe it was from all the dust particles. And so does Nevada. But Arizona just seems to have the most more often, I guess. But yeah, it has, it, there's a science fact behind it. <laughs> That's good to know because, yeah, I, I do have to tend to agree with you, Allie. For sunrises, I have not seen the colors that I've seen in um, in Arizona. And this is coming from somebody that's extremely colorblind. And for me to appreciate the colors that I see um, in the sunset, it happens so frequently there. Those sunsets are pretty regular. Yeah. Almost every day. Yeah, I didn't know that it was because of the, the dust particles, but that kind of makes sense. It's just bouncing the light off, off the desert. I think that's how it goes. It's been a while. It's been about three years since I've looked that up. Because I was like, I'm going to prove that the sunsets in Arizona are the best ones in the country. <laughs> Sunrise, I don't know. I have yet to sunsets like on the Pacific Ocean. I would love to see a sunrise on the Atlantic Ocean. I have yet to do that. And I'm assuming I've seen some pictures of the Florida coast and the beautiful water down there or even, you know, in the Caribbean or something like that. You know, I'm sure that a sunrise there is magnificent. So I still think Arizona are the best sunrises from my personal <laughs> point of view. But I bet there's some pretty cool ones out there, too. Yeah. You get a, a chance to, to explore those I mean, your travels. Now, kind of getting back into hiking, Allie, I feel that some hikers have a summit ritual or maybe an a end-of-the-hike routine. Maybe it's a favorite snack or meal. Maybe some trail beverages or just a moment of zen. Do you have a regular custom that you do when you reach your destination or maybe when you make it back out? I do. For the longer hikes, definitely. I, I just have to say... I. I listen to your other episodes and I I get a little like, wait, am I doing this wrong? Because a lot of people pop open a can of beer or they drink wine or whatever. And I go, I must be doing this wrong. Something's wrong with me because I don't drink on the trail. I may afterwards, you know, but um, on the trail, I generally don't. When I get to the destination, whether it's a peak or, you know, a halfway point or whatever, I usually just drink water and eat a cliff bar. <laughs> Or I'll take an apple and some nuts. I'm, it's not fancy. Um, if it's a longer hike, like I plan out, you know, maybe a, what seems like a full day, but I'm going to hit lunchtime. I'll take a sandwich with me, just ham and cheese, you know, or tuna. <laughs> But no, nothing special. Just take in the view and enjoy. Usually once you sit down for a while, 
whether it's a desert forest, almost anywhere, beaches, whatever, lakes, rivers, whatever. Um, once you sit down for a little while and there's not a lot of people around, a lot of the birds will start coming out again and, and feeling comfortable to move around again. So if you sit there for just a little while, you can have lunch and watch the birds usually. So I guess it is a little bit of a Zen moment. I usually do that during my hike anyway. You touch the trees and you look at the leaves and the way that things shine. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, every everyone's a little different. And this year, I saw something that I kind of got that moment where I was like, maybe I'm doing this wrong. But I saw some hikers bring out uh, basically like a charcuterie board at the top of the summit and with wine glasses. And I'm like, oh, I'm looking a little rough here with, you know, my my beer and, you know, Cliff Bar granola bar. And these people are having a charcuterie board. But yeah, everyone's a little right? different. <laughs> yeah. I love it though. I I love that. I love that everybody does their hike their own way. Some just want to power through it. Um, some want to have the cheese and crackers and wine experience. I love it. As long as people get out. <laughs> Definitely, you know, it's it's a good experience if you're gonna be having wine and cheese and crackers. Why not have it on top of a mountain? You, you know, you, you kind of smell and you're gruffy and your hair's all messed up, but you got that cheese and crackers and wine. Yeah. <laughs> <I> can, <laughs> hikers can still do it right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, when it comes to your, your pack list um, on your hikes, Allie, what would you consider to be your most valuable piece of gear? And has there been a piece of gear that you were really excited about, but it ended up not working out the way that you had hoped? My shoes. My shoes are the one piece of gear that have to be like that perfect fit because I have problem feet and I am, I am 50. <laughs> so I don't have like cushioning on my feet anymore. So you have to have extra support, extra this, extra that, extra arch support, extra <laughs> cushioning. All. So the shoes are very important, you know, to help save my knees and my hips and all that other stuff too, you know, as you get older. So my shoes are probably my most important right after water. I'm a big water drinker, but I would say my, my shoes are my most valued piece of gear above anything, probably except water. <laughs> are you a, a boots um, type of hiker or, or more of the, the low cut? I moved to um, trail runners. Actually, I never moved to them. I just moved from my regular runners because I use Brooks. I used to run in Brooks shoes. Which one are they? Oh, gosh, it doesn't matter the name. Um, and then once I started realizing I'm into hiking, then I just switched to Brooks trail runners. And I just stuck with them even through through hikes and climbing anything and i actually i thought i was doing it wrong you know when you first start hiking you think you're doing it wrong but i used to be a huge fan i still am of dixie i think every hiker through hiker knows who she is she was the one that touted the trail runners and she's a big name in the hiking community so i thought well i guess i'm doing it right then <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely something that's growing in popularity you know th these last two years trail runners i'm seeing more and more hikers especially in the summer months um, wearing those it's definitely got me intrigued because i normally wear a boot that gives me a little bit more ankle support but on a hot summer day your feet are just sweating and, and you don't want that moisture in, in your boot and it seems like the trail runner gives you the traction that you'd get from a boot but um, a little bit more breathability definitely more breathability for sure and i don't get the well i don't know if trail runners come that way but i don't get the ones that are what is it waterproof water resistant yeah i don't get those so yeah they're pretty breathable for me at least now has there been a, a piece of gear that you've gotten in the last couple of years that ended up not working out like you had hoped <laughs> yeah i had to i had to think about this one for a little bit because i'm like i'm such a minimalist that i usually just deal with the gear even if i don't like it unless it hurts you know but <laughs> i've been pretty lucky with most of my gear but i used to have this wide brimmed hat because I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in the sun a lot. And after a while, you sweat off the sunblock or you don't, I don't like, I wear a tank top and I still wear running clothes when I hike. The, the sh you know, shorts, very, very lightweight materials that dry immediately. So, and I don't wear, I don't cover my skin. A lot of people like to cover their skin, obviously for, you know, you don't want to get burnt or get 
skin cancer. I can't hike in all those clothes. So, you know, I'm lathering on this sunblock. And so I bought a wide brimmed hat and I hated it. I hated it. I, I don't know how people wear them. Um, they, it would hit the back of my backpack all the time and knock on my, it gave me a headache. And I thought, this is a great idea for protecting my shoulders and my head and my face and everything and my neck. But uh uh-uh, no, I'll just keep putting on the sunblock. I, I bought an umbrella instead. I People go, how do you carry the umbrella? I go, I just like this. I don't want to wear a hat. <laughs> so I ended up buying the umbrella. <laughs> when I was living in Arizona, that's the first time I, I got a wide brim hat because hiking in the spring and summer, you kind of need that protection from, you know, the hundred plus degrees that are, are going on. But Even if it's 65. Yeah. <laughs> That sun bakes you in Arizona. Yeah. yeah. But it, it it was a challenge because they, they don't pack that easily if you got to put them away. And at least for me, I had the one with the attachment that kind of covered up your neck so your neck didn't get burned. Yeah. Um, not, not to mention, you, you don't look that cool in them either. Not that I'm out there trying to look cool, yeah. but I'm like, I already don't look cool. I don't need to not really look, you know, like <laughs> rise, raise it up a notch. <laughs> I'm already wearing all kinds of no, colors yeah. and nothing matches. <laughs> I'm wearing ugly brown <laughs> socks, you know, so I don't need to make it worse. I'm sweating. I stink. <laughs> I already have the cool factor at zero. <laughs> All I needed was the zinc sunscreen on my nose to really pull off the look with the big brim hat and, and look like a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cutting down. I mean, I, I wish I could wear one because they are much better than carrying around the umbrella. The umbrella does cover me more. It covers more, you know, gives me more shade. But I wish I could wear one. That's what I'm saying. But it would just give me a headache. Um, so it was a big gear fail. That one definitely was donated. Throughout all your hikes and, and travels, Allie, have you had any close calls, whether it's being stuck in a storm or, or just Mother Nature throwing you a curveball? Maybe it's an unexpected wildlife encounter or maybe just run-ins with some, some weird individuals. Have you had any of those experiences on your travels? I have been extremely fortunate to not have anything that scared the bejesus out of me. I've been very fortunate because I've hiked a lot by myself. I've backpacked by myself. And, you know, you're always prepared to come across a bear or unfortunately maybe a mountain lion. But I've been very fortunate. I see prints, but in also the human species too. I've been very fortunate to usually come across other hikers or people on the trail that are gracious or just ignore you one or the other or something like that. But um, nothing ever, you know, that scared me, made me worry. The only thing that ever really has happened to me, and it, it could have turned bad, I guess. I was in Colorado hiking and there's this one trail in a town called Winter Park and it's known for a resident moose family. So sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. (laughs) I saw them one time and Mama Moose decided to start following me. And there was a lot of other people on the trail. It just happens that the moose were on the go. And it's a very popular trail, which was kind of striking that the moose started following me when there were people right ahead of me. And so she started kind of following me and I went, well, she's a big creature, so I'll just start backing up. And as I backed up, Daddy Moose came out of nowhere. Oh, oh, there's Daddy Moose. Okay, so he's about 15 feet from me. And I'm. I, this time I thought I could probably run. You know, they're not predators. So I, when I turned around to kind of step up my pace, I ran into two, two or three other um, hikers. And I, I, they were coming up the trail. And I said, there's moose up there. And they go, really? <laughs> and we all got excited. And the moose kind of started following. So we had to bushwhack a few hundred yards out of the way to go around these moose. Yeah, they had a baby and everything. I'm not familiar with moose behavior. You know, you try to when you're I don't know about other hikers, but I try to become familiar with animal behavior, specifically like mountain lions and rattlesnakes. What did you know, what do they do when they don't like that you're there? So but I wasn't familiar with moose. I thought maybe they were just I, I, naively. I thought, oh, they're just like any other hooved animal. No, they're not. <laughs> they, in, in terms of hooved animals, they can be a little aggressive, I guess. I don't know. But 
they decided to follow me and I didn't want to make it worse by just standing there going, Hey, Moose, you know, do you want me to pet you? So no, it kind of freaked me out after because when I read that they do follow you to make sure that their baby is is okay. They're just basically escorting you away. <laughs> but I've heard of people getting injured by moose. That's just, that's it. Like, it turned out to be a funny story, actually. And they're so big. I, I think, um, you know, people don't know how large they are until they come across it. And it's, it's substantially bigger than any of the other hoofed animals that you come across. They are just huge. They're magnificent creatures, but from far away, for sure. It, it, what was weird is that that trail is extremely popular for um, people in the area. And people were walking back and forth. And the moose just happened to pick me to start following. I'm like, I'm, there's groups of children and dogs and, you know, and they just let him pass. <laughs> I guess they were on the move. Did you get a, a snap of picture once you were at, from a safe distance? I tried. When I came back down, I walked really, really slow. I'm looking around, looking around. Of course, you know, animals are perfect camouflage. That's what they do. So I'm looking around going, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? They had moved on. But there was one female sitting about maybe 15 feet to my left. And she was just kind of sitting, grazing. She was really relaxed. And I felt comfortable enough to slow down a little bit to record her in video. So, but I didn't want to stop because I didn't know where the other moose were. All I knew was she was there and she seemed pretty chill. So I was like, I'm not going to approach her, but I'll just, as I pass the trail, I'll record her because, yeah, I do try to give wild, I, well, I do give wildlife their, um, you know, their privacy. <laughs> We're in their house. So, but she decided to sit by the trail. So I'm going to go ahead and film her. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now for, for folks that are getting interested into hiking alley and um, for someone like you that, has recently transitioned from running to hiking. What advice would you have to first-time hikers in order for them to have a safe and rewarding experience on the trails? And then also for folks that are interested in living on the road and being a nomad, what would be some advice that you'd give those individuals? Um, well, for first-time hikers, I think one well, of the basics for me is enjoy it. Just enjoy it. You're out in nature, even if it's just the trail that leads from your neighborhood you're out in nature and just just take it in you're you're not on a sidewalk you're not around buildings you're on trees you're on cactus take it in i don't know how to explain that um with all your senses you know see what you can see from different shadows and sunlight smell what you can smell sometimes it's very faint but you might smell different oils and from the pine trees or in the deserts we have the i think they're called creosote 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 and after it rains they're just it's a beautiful smell touch the trees and the rocks and see what they feel like if they're cold hot warm rough i just uh, just experience it you know you'll feel better if you just slow down and do that even if it's just for 10 minutes or an hour it doesn't matter but in terms of like safety um, that's more of the enjoyable part that's what i do but in terms of safety i always i overpack i'm such a worry wart i do it with my rv too um i have two ways of filtering water even when i'm in the desert there's no water out here i carry two liters of water i carry um there's two types of filters for my water um i carry a couple of bars i carry nuts i carry you know dried fruit you have the i have the 10 essentials covered more than what you need my pack probably weighs between 10 and 12 pounds. When I go out, even just for a day hike, I'm such a worry wart. I want to make sure if something happens, I'm fed and I have water and I'm warm. <laughs> so definitely look into the 10 essentials. I think those are super important. I think a lot of them are for more of emergencies than pleasure, you know, when you're out there. But you, you never know when you might come into an emergency or somebody else might, and you might be able to help them out. You know, if you carry extra water and they run out, I've given water to people. So uh, the other one is since I'm a lone hiker, I usually do tell, I have two people that I generally tell where I am and it's you know, my best friend and my mom. They both have um, access to find out where I am at any given time. So I'll check in with them and let them know, hey, <laughs> when I was just in Big Ben just a few uh, weeks ago and I text mom and I text my friend and I said, hey, I'm going into Mexico. 
if I don't answer you in three hours, <laughs> definitely get a hold of customs, <laughs> you know, jokingly, but they do know where I am. So always let somebody know where you are or take somebody with you. So you always have that backup and they know. The, the other thing is, is that I just realized not too long ago, I watched this guy that he runs in Lake Havasu and two times in two weeks, he says, I, he, he said on his Instagram stories, I came across hikers that were lost again. And he runs the trails and he uses an app, you know, a running app to follow his tracks. And he goes, I can't believe people are getting lost out here. And you can, you can get easily turned around in the desert very fast. Take a map, learn how to use a map, learn how to use the compass with the map. And or use an app. There's so many apps that will just follow where you walked. Even if you're offline, it'll still follow where you walked. So if you get turned around, you go, okay, let me just follow that blue line back. So that has saved me a lot of times because I hike where there's a lot of animal trails sometimes and you end up following the animal trails and you go, wait a minute, this doesn't look like a trail anymore or it just ends. And so you have to follow your tracks back. I'm notorious for that. That's why I'm Allie rambles. I just kind of ramble along. Um, but those are the things that I would highly suggest to all new newcomers to hiking. Def- above everything, enjoy it. Enjoy getting out there. Now, the, the second part of the question, Allie, was for those folks interested in, in van life or, or being a nomad, what are some advice or tips that you'd give people that are interested in, in uh, getting involved in that lifestyle? There's quite a few. But the biggest complaint I've actually heard from people is that they simply just don't like the lifestyle. You know, like, I miss my house. I miss my stuff. So if you're thinking about being a nomad and really, really getting down into a van, especially a van, um, and not a motorhome or a travel trailer where you can fit more stuff, but you do give up some of those luxuries. It's freaking cold out here at night. And so you do give up luxuries that you take for granted in a house, like a shower <laughs> or heat overnight, because I can't run my heater overnight. It'll drain my batteries. So um, you do have to take in consideration whether or not you do want to put up with the uncomfortableness of it sometimes for the grandeur of meeting people and seeing beautiful places. You have to like to drive unless you are. Uh, I've, I've known people that just like to stay in, you know, they'll stay in quartzite or just the desert and then they might move up a little bit. They don't travel a lot. So that depends on your lifestyle, but you still have to like to drive something big. <laughs> you have to be willing to give up your stuff and your, your, some of your conveniences. Sometimes you don't have a signal. You're out of the phone for three days. I, I had to move to, to actually talk to you. I was up in a place that I thought had a signal and it doesn't. So I moved yesterday. <laughs> so um, definitely, yeah, <laughs> there's so many things, but I, I just love this lifestyle so much. There are times where I'm traveling. I go, okay, I've, I've driven 300 miles today. I'm done with this lifestyle. I'm done. I'm done. And then I think about it. I go, and this is literally what I think. If I buy a house or live in an apartment or a condo, I'm going to be stuck hiking the same trails all year long. And it just kills me. I go, no, 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 no. I want to hike in other places. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. You have that internal dialogue where you kind of <laughs> realize the benefits and and the the challenges that come with it. It's almost like a death sentence to me. I can't hike the same trail every weekend. I just can't. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be it'd be difficult to to jump into that lifestyle and then go back to to just kind of regular life like you said hiking the same trail systems around your house or apartment when you've had the experience of driving to see not just different landscapes but different states. You get spoiled. I, I feel spoiled. I feel very spoiled. Yeah, I, I definitely look into into that lifestyle as something that I think can be rewarding if, if you do it correctly. Well, you would definitely get some amazing interviews in different states, interviewing people that experience the Appalachias as, a, uh, as opposed to, you know, the Sierra Nevadas, you know, different hiker attitudes in different parts of the region the nation <laughs> that might be a good spin-off podcast ali you just gave me a good idea <laughs> it does make you wonder do, do people that hike down south have different um 
like a view of hiking than people say in in Washington, Oregon, and the Sierras, California, and such. If it's different, <laughs> I haven't been to the Appalachia area or the South yet. Well, I have part of it, but not the mountainous. I'll let you know when it happens. <laughs> well, one thing I I did learn, and I think um, this episode will be out after this other episode where a hiker from upstate New York told me that she makes whistles out of acorn caps. So if you are in an emergency, you can use the acorn cap to make like an emergency whistle. And I was like, oh, wow, that is something I, I would have never thought of. But yeah, I think hearing everyone's stories, everyone's, you know, take on hiking, I think only can can help you in growing in it. So we're winding down 2022. Do you have any upcoming travel goals or hiking goals for 2023? I generally don't set goals, but I do have like bucket, mental bucket lists, I guess. I still want to try to finish the Arizona Trail. I only have 600 more miles to go. (laughs) But I'd like to backpack more of it. But that's not necessarily in 23. But I'd like to, you know, knock off some more miles, maybe up above the Grand Canyon, the Kaibab Plateau up there. I believe that's what it's called, Kaibab Plateau. I still want to either get up to Washington and Oregon or Maine or (laughs) Georgia. I'm not sure. You know, Georgia, the Virginias, um, all of like the, you know, hike there. I don't know. So it's just a matter of, and gosh, I don't know. I just go where the weather looks good. So I like that, wherever the road takes you. Wherever the road takes me. It's kind of, it, it is a little bit frustrating sometimes when I go places and there are no hiking trails. That's the hard part. And that's partially why I bought a bike. I have like a very uh, beginner mountain bike. So at least if there's no hiking trails, I can still get outdoors and ride my bike like on a forest road or even city or, you know, city roads and stuff like that and get out. But it, believe me, it's my secondary. I want to hike. <laughs> so there's places I've been. I'm like, there's no hiking trails. It's driving me nuts. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I stick to Colorado a lot of times. I've heard Washington State and Oregon are kind of like that, too where you can camp and hike. I would definitely recommend spring and early summer just because things are are green, the spring flowers are are going, and then hopefully you can beat the summer forest fires because it seems like each year there's either weeks, if not months, of, of smoke up here in the Pacific Northwest. I was lucky enough this last summer to avoid any, excuse me, any of the wildfires. Um, I'm originally from California, so... Unfortunately, you have wildfire season and it just seems to be growing and growing. And I have had to move about because of the the forest fires. I was in Prescott, Arizona in the mountains up there and a forest fire started and I had to evacuate. They originally weren't going to let me back to my RV because I didn't, I couldn't block the road. They only left, let um, emergency vehicles in. I was like, I was talking to my girl, that's my home. My house is up there. And they said, we can't let you up there to get it. <laughs> so my like, gosh. So it was a good four or five hours of waiting and hoping. The fire was still five miles away, I found out later, away from my RV. But they needed the road open is what happened. But oh, gosh, it was nerve wracking. So yes, yeah, sometimes you do hop around. And, and it's just it's so devastating to hear about the wildfires in the West when you start hearing about them. It's so sad. Yeah, it's... um. Something that unfortunately is becoming a, a new normal out in the West. Uh, yeah, I hope that you you make it up here and see the Pacific Northwest and and all that it has to offer. Definitely, I've been dying to get up there. <laughs> now that's that's it for the the regular questions, Allie. This next portion of the podcast is the this or that questions, and it sounds like you you got familiar with the, the questions. So I'm just gonna give you two options, all hiking related, and you just choose the one that that fits you. All set. Mm-hmm. So ascending or descending? Ascending. Waterfalls or summits? Waterfalls. Uh, Switchbacks or straight up? Switchbacks. Trek poles or freehand? Freehand. And do you fuel up before a hike or do you fill up after? I remember you asking this question every time and I go, the whole time. (laughs) Before, during, and after. But question, definitely before. (laughs) Yes, snacking throughout. (laughs) And do you bushwhack or go around? Bushwhack. And do you jump in or stay dry? Jump in. Sunsets or sunrises? For hiking, I have to say sunrises. Okay. 
that, that early morning fresh dew in the in it just feels so fresh. Nobody else is out there. So sunrise. Okay. Spring flowers or fall colors? Spring flowers. And do you tag a hike or do you not tag a hike? <sighs> I'm gonna say no even though I do sometimes, but they're just the popular one. I've been hiking a couple days ago and I didn't let anybody know where it is. Nobody knows, it's hard to get to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you gotta keep those, those special ones yeah. protected. I, I definitely have a hike or two where I, I try not to tag it because it's already becoming more and more popular. Yeah, it's really hard to with the nomad life as well. You don't wanna tell people where you've been staying, but you know, like I'm sitting somewhere where there's hundreds of people around me hundreds <laughs> so yes and once i leave here i'm gonna say yeah i was in this parking area because it's well known it's well known i'm not giving away the location <laughs> but if there was nobody around me and i really really liked the place you're not gonna find out where i was <laughs> <laughs> and being a, a user at least like on my end Something that I've really enjoyed now is for those that aren't tagged, is doing the research to find where exactly that picture was taken. And that almost adds to the to the excitement and, and the joy that it brings you. Because you can do the research, you can find it, and then once you actually do it, it just seems a little bit more extra rewarding because you did the research. It definitely does. It definitely does. It feeds to our, our human um, curiosity and, and the accomplishment you feel, not just from finding the location, but actually hiking into the waterfall that was there or the beautiful meadow of flowers or something, you know. Yeah, if my Instagram and either my YouTube channel or whatever online grows massively, I'll probably tag less and less and less because there's less people. Gotcha. And yeah, kind of using that as a segue, Ali, is um, for folks interested in following you online, um, what's your social media handle for Instagram and then also YouTube? And is there any other social media outlets that people can follow you adventures? Those are the two that I'm most active. But you can find me anywhere online as Ali Rambles, whether it's one word or two, anywhere. I have the blog by that name. I, yeah, but I'm most active on Instagram and YouTube. And so Instagram is Ally Rambles. And um, YouTube just started giving us names now. The little, what is it called? URL, your handle. So they just started handing those out a few months ago. So I'm. it's called I'm Ally Rambles. I didn't get a chance to just snag Ally Rambles. So I'm. it's I'm Ally Rambles. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be sure to, to add those to the episode of notes um, so people can follow your adventures. But Thank you so much, Ali. It's been really great talking to you and, and hearing your story and, and learning about your adventures. Really had a great time talking with you. Definitely. Anytime. Love talking about hiking. It's so fun. Thank you. Thank you to Ali for joining us on the latest episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. Make sure to follow her on Instagram at Ali Rambles, as well as on YouTube at I Am Ali Rambles to see videos from her adventures across the states. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. We'll be putting out new episodes every week through the fall and winter. Be sure to like and subscribe to not miss out on those. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Hikes and Mikes. Catch you on the next one. This episode's music was created by Ketza. Follow him on Instagram at Ketza Music. This episode is brought to you by Flip Socks. Whether you're on the trail, on the job, or in the yard, Flip Socks will keep Mother Nature out of your boots with their innovative nylon sleeve. You no longer need to worry about any annoying debris getting trapped in your boots during your hikes. Simply flip down the nylon sleeve over any boot to prevent Mother Nature from finding its way inside, keeping your feet comfortable all day long. To get your first pair, visit FlipSocksWithAZ.com and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for listeners who use the promo code at checkout, I'll be donating 100% of the Season 2 promo code proceeds to Big City Mountaineers, who provide transformative experiences through connections to nature that strengthen life skills and build community for youth and disinvested communities across the nation. So if you're tired of bits and pieces of the trail finding its way into your hiking boots, pick up a pair of flip socks today with the promo code HIKESMIKES10 to get 10% off. For website and promo code, See the episode description.